There has been a sudden sharp deterioration in short-term demand narrative in the management commentaries of companies within the consumption space. When a generally measured management like Hindustan Unilever uses the term recession in its comments, it generally isn't a one-quarter blip. Let's talk about how d damaging this is for the industry at large with Vinita Bali, Independent Director of Global Boards and former Managing Director, Britannia Industries. Ms. Bali, thanks very much for taking out the time. This has been a sudden commentary change that we've been seeing uh, from just one quarter away. So it's a very short span of time over which such damaging commentary has come out from most of the big wigs within the consumption industry. How have you read into these trends? Actually, Devida, I'm surprised that it has come as a surprise because um, I think the writing has been on the wall for some time, both in terms of macro as well as micro indicators. And what do I mean by that? You know, um, in a way, if I were to really simplify and dumb it down, uh, consumption demand is a factor of how much money people have, how, how good they're feeling about their life, and therefore their propensity to spend. So if I look at the macro factors, we've been seeing a decline in the growth of our GDP. Uh, we have seen uh, industrial uh, capacity uh, being less and less utilized. Uh, we are seeing a liquidity crunch in the market because of a variety of factors. We have been seeing not an increase in employment, but frankly, a decrease in employment in several sectors. And when I take all this into account and superimpose on this the fact that only about you know 10 or 12 percent of India is formally employed, um, it, it is very obvious that this consumption story should be challenged the way we are seeing it being challenged today. So, you know, the numbers have suddenly hit us, but the trend has been there for a very long time. When I say very long time, certainly in the last three to four quarters. So, you know, while you say that this has been a trend that you've been seeing over the last uh, two or three quarters and this shouldn't have probably come as a surprise, this did not quite reflect in the commentary that most of these managements of the top four FMCG companies at least gave when they reported their quarter three numbers uh, for FY19. Does this probably raise questions in the short term narrative and the models, the management models uh, and the unpredictability of it as much as what the analyst models are? Uh, are also uh, being touted as unpredictable. You know, I, um, Devina, I don't think this is so much an issue of modeling as much as it is having, um, you know, your eyes open and a ear to the ground. So without getting into any specific company, because, you know, ind individual companies have done better or worse, though in this quarter, at least so far, most of the FMCG companies are showing volumes which are in the band of 2 to 7% increase. So, you know, single digit. I think what is absolutely critical is uh, if, we, if you go back and analyze uh, what the results have been, I think there has been a good increase in profitability, largely on account of cost effectiveness and efficiency measures, cost cutting and things like that. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you superimpose another fact, and that is the reality of the market in India, mm. which is both underpenetrated and underserved across most of the categories that we are talking about, we should actually be seeing more robust growths than we are, even if you look at the December quarter numbers. So, um, you know, I think, and having been there myself, you know, when you're an executive, you say, OK, you know, this is probably uh, just uh, a challenge in this quarter and things will be different because we've got all our initiatives going. We've got new product launches, this, that and the other. Yeah. But the fact is that if you're not uh, clear about what's happening with the money that your consumers have in their pocket, yeah. then, you know, it is a lag effect, but it is going to show up. Yeah, which is which is why I asked you about the unpredictability of uh, of the model that most managements are using at this point in time versus the analysts. The other point being, uh, you know, the difference between the I rural. Think, uh, Devina, if I could interrupt. Yeah, I think sure. Is, uh, sorry, 
I think there is also a lot of hope built into the model. And, uh, you know, to be serious, uh, a lot of initiatives that, you know, management's put in sure. place whenever, um, you know, demand generation is a challenge, especially in the low unit priced, high velocity FMCG industry. Cars are different. Yeah. Yeah, uh, which will we'll come to that, you know, the low unit price and the trend of that in just a few moments. Uh, but but I, I just want to talk a little bit more about this gap that we're now seeing between rural and urban demand. I mean, rural demand, which was the earlier driver, you know, seems to have taken a little bit of a backseat um, lately. Is that something that was also, um, you know, in the works, in the mix that have probably, the signs of which have probably not been read? You know, to me, Devina, it was not a surprise, and I'll tell you why I am saying that. Um, if you look at the rural economy, you know, on the one hand, we we were very happy with uh, low food inflation, with a benign commodity scenario, etc. But if, again, you look at it very simply, your food inflation and my food inflation is the money that the farmer earns on what we buy. And therefore, farm incomes have actually been stressed for a fairly long period of time. Um, and we can see that in the numbers of consumption. We can see that in the numbers, you know, last year was good for, uh, you know, for, for categories like tractors, et cetera. But if you compare it with the year before, they were recycling a very poor year. So overall, rural incomes have been under stress. Uh, overall, rural consumption has been under stress and therefore, organizations or companies that have a fair bit of their sales coming from rural are going to feel that stress more and we've seen it in some of the results that have been declared already hmm. uh, you know just to bring about that point and i want to uh, read this from a comment coming in from nielsen which has suggested that uh, you know there has been a decoupling in terms of uh, rural income versus dependence on crop cycles and the agricultural income so the dependence 50 percent only now Keeping that in mind, do you still believe that, you know, if at all the farm income component gets affected, there'll be a bigger impact on the FMCG players? You know, I don't understand what they mean when they say uh, rural income is only half from agriculture. I mean, the two sources of income in rural India, if I am, uh, you know, uh, if I live there, is my agricultural income. And secondly, is income that I might earn from schemes like uh, Narega and so on, which, you know, gives a member in my family employment for 100 days and so on. There is no other source of uh, rural income. It's not as though we've gone and set up, you know, service industries or anything else that is going to boost or supplement uh, the income of the farmer. So and I, I think we've seen those signs. We've seen those signs in terms of farmer agitations. We've seen those signs in terms of a slowing down of, for example, uh, you know, two-wheeler demand, et cetera. So, you know, these things don't happen suddenly. I think they happen slowly and steadily. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why we miss it. And, uh, you know, we are always living in the future and we are hopeful that things will turn. And, uh, you know, that is the reason why whichever government comes in, you know, they've got their schemes lined up in terms of how to put more money in the hand of, in the hands of the rural population, because that is the only way to boost consumption there. And when we talk about markets that are under-marketed and under-penetrated, you know, rural markets are even worse off than some of our urban markets. Hmm. What do you, what according to you, Ms. Bali, is going to be, uh, since we're mostly talking about the short-term narrative, According to you, what is going to be the most immediate short-term threat uh, that probably have been missed out or not been read yet? You know, <laughs> there's only so much that can be done in the short term. As I said, people will spend money, A, if they have money to spend, B, if they're feeling good about themselves, and there is an overarching feeling of well-being. Now, you know, these three things have to come together. They can be certain boosters, uh, what has not helped, as I said, is the combination of the macro and micro factors um, in this case. So, 
I think effort will have to be put in very significantly and very, very seriously on doing multiple things simultaneously. I think as far as uh, companies and industries are concerned, you know, they'll try everything in the book. You know, we'll see more promotions. We'll see greater emphasis on distribution. We'll see lots of price reductions. We're seeing that, um, you know, in the e-commerce channel, etc. though in the bigger scheme of things, e-commerce accounts for a smaller proportion of the kind of consumption we are talking about. So many things have to uh, happen. But I think the one fact that we cannot forget is if there isn't, uh, work that is done at a structural and systemic level to create more jobs, to put more money in the hands of lower middle, middle and lower income Indians, mm. you know, not the, uh, you know, the elite at the top. Um, we're not going to see this consumption led boost that we have, you know, that has actually helped India's economy uh, in many, many years. Our exports were impacted as a result of several factors, whether you call it the lingering effect of demonetization or GST. Several export units have had to actually close down. And again, I go back to my theme of, you know, if I am a daily wage earner, mm. either because I'm a casual laborer or I sell, you know, flowers outside a temple, um, at the end of the day, the only money I have to spend is the money I've earned in that day. And, uh, you know, so it becomes a little bit of a vicious cycle. If people become more careful in spending money, then everybody has less money to spend. Is there a different tactical approach? We, we're looking at, you know, lower unit prices now uh, as becoming uh, more favored within the rural uh, markets, at least. Within the urban, urban markets, a price point of closer to 10 to 15 is more preferred. Is that an angle to look at? Because obviously, while that you puts know, that's volumes, that's uh, that is actually uh, detrimental on the margins for most of the, the, the companies. Yeah, you know, that is an angle which, frankly, the good FMCG companies have almost perfected. Where, you know, the, we look at price points, we look at velocity at a price point, and so on. But, you know, again, let's not fool ourselves. I will only buy, you know, if I don't have enough money to buy four cups of tea, um, I'm going to, you know, reduce my one cup of tea. Um, and that is going to affect consumption. I think the only way to really boost demand is to create that pull from consumers. And that pull from consumers, you know, in the short term can actually be uh, stimulated by giving some short term incentives, etc. But I think sustainably, the only way to do that is, um, you know, actually is to ensure, as far as industry is concerned, um, you know, create more jobs to look after the people that are employed better, uh, to look at avenues of investment. Mm. We've also, uh, you know, we've also seen, for example, in manufacturing, uh, the proportion of people employed in manufacturing has been virtually static at about 17 or 18 percent. We're not seeing that kind of activity. So we're looking at stimulating both the macro indicators of the economy as well as the things that companies are good at doing, which is we'll increase our distribution, we'll give you know better margins to retailers, we will reduce the per unit price for consumers. Uh, you know, all of those things will help, but those are addressing the symptom. I think if we have to address the underlying uh, slackening of demand, then many more things have to happen. Hmm. So while we've been talking about uh, the volume slacking, uh, attribution comes also to the high base effect that we have seen. Would you say that this is not just about the base? Would you say that this is more also to do with overall slackening of demand? Or would you say that, you know, uh, on a CAGR basis, if you consider, um, consider the base, it's fine. We've been doing what we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, you know, um, I also feel that, again, if you go back to my uh, hypothesis, which I'm repeating over and over again, if India is going to see a robust growth mm. uh, led by consumption and demand, yeah. 
then one of the things that we have to really understand and internalize is that we actually have to concentrate on increasing volumes because in most product market segments, we are nowhere close to uh, maturing or saturation if we were to look at the per capita consumption, you know, whether it is toothpaste yeah, or end. soap or oil or edible oil or biscuit or whatever. So our focus really has to be on what do we have to do to increase per capita consumption, which is what will increase velocity. Part of that has to do with uh, accessibility and affordability, what you mentioned earlier, yeah. price points and so on. But part of it also has to do with, you know, what is happening to our income per capita. Now, if our income per capita is not increasing significantly, uh, you know, where is this consumption going to suddenly come from? Uh, we can have short-term uh, measures and short-term blips, but I think in the long term, um, you know, margins will get adjusted. I think industry will feel the pressure. I think there'll be another pressure point, which is you that, so, you know, so if what do you think is at, going to be uh, the adjustment? What do you think will be the margin adjustment? Since you mentioned it, how much do you think could be the correction? You know, the margin factor is, I I think some companies will probably in the short term, um, uh, you know, sacrifice margin to boost uh, volume, uh, you know, which again is something which is not new and unusual. Um, I think we companies will begin to look at, you know, the overall combination of uh, volume and margin and not the percentage margin alone. Yeah. Um, I think that coupled with measures that companies are taking to take unnecessary cost out of the system mm. will actually, they will try their best to balance profitability or the trading margins, which again is an important indicator of uh, profitability. But I think in the short term, uh, it's quite likely that we will see some margin adjustments, a greater emphasis on cost effectiveness and cost reduction. Yeah. Uh, you know, more collaborations. It's interesting to see what Toyota and Maruti are going to do together. Again, uh, you know, a sector which is fairly stressed. So we may actually see some new innovative models. But at the end of the day, it's about how much money do I as a consumer have to spend and what am I going to spend it on? All right. Uh, interesting takeaways there, Vinita. Thank you so very much, Ms. Bali, for joining in. Really appreciate you taking up the time on this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. All right. That was Vinita Bali there. She's the ex-MD of Britannia talking about the current situation at large within the consumption industry. And according to her, it was writing on the wall. So it shouldn't have come as a surprise what's happened with most of the FMCG companies in the last and final quarter of this financial year. Thanks a lot for watching.